Yeah. This is a member of our tribe. I am. He knows what we go through. He feels it. He's been there. He relates. That's why we got the real wolf of Wall Street, hey, Jordan yo. Belfort. Guys, I want you to humor me one time. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right, stop. Guess what? I never actually did that. <laughs> Here's a great story. And I got so many stories today. Listen, I only have one hour to speak, and I'll probably go over. Is it okay if I go over a little bit, guys? Yeah. Some of you have a fear of public speaking. I love you too, by the way, right? You guys are my brethren. When you hear my story, you guys are going to die because it's right in your sweet spot. But some people have a fear of public speaking. I have a fear of not public speaking. <laughs> You gotta get a hook to get me off the stage, right? They gotta send to the National Guard to get me off stage, right? Anyway, guys, in all seriousness, here's what I did do, though. The story is, is that when they were filming that scene, it was the first scene Matthew McConaughey was filming. And he, right before they start, he goes off into the corner, and Scorsese's there, and DiCaprio, and he goes, uh huh, huh. And Mars like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's like, uh -huh, uh -huh. and Leo's like, it's like his kind of like little chant he does to get himself into state. And Mars like, I love this because we have to make this part of the movie. And it actually became this whole war cry throughout the movie, and everyone just loved it. Now there's like, you know, you look in the, in the Tomorrowland and all the and the soccer guys in the World Cup are doing it. Like, it's hysterical. But here's the deal: what? Matthew McConaughey is doing. By the way, I'm just getting my voice back because I'm on such a long speaking tour. My voice is shot, right? Always. But he's getting himself into a state for acting, a state of certainty, confidence, clarity, right? And today, and you've probably heard this, we call that state management. But back in the day when I was first, you know, cutting my teeth and training the Stratonites, right? And, excuse me, we called it staying positive not getting negative. And I knew intuitively from my own experience, and I'll tell you it's phenomenal, you're gonna love it, right? That if my brokers got negative, they wouldn't produce. Unless they were pumped up in a peak state. So every morning we'd stand up, I had them squeeze their hands together and say the word yes. That's what we do, just yes. And again, yes, until the one went crystal. Let's do that real quick, ready? One, two, three, yes. yes. One, two, three. Yes. Louder. One, two, three. Yes. One more time. Ring the door. Come on. One, two, three. Yes. Right. Now close your eyes for a second and imagine where you're going to be in one year from now. See yourself in the picture. One year from now, guys, I'm going to be giving you some distinctions tonight that are really going to help you make more money. But just see yourself with a great life, living the exact life you want, working your tail off and loving it. Just get that picture clear and make it bigger in your mind's eye. Take a few deep breaths, stand tall, squeeze your hands together and just one, two, three. Yes! Louder, one, two, three. Yes! One last time, one, two, three. Yes! All right, come on, round of applause. <laughs> Take a seat. So I, I have only an hour. It's a, you know, an hour, so I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. Number one, at certain times, I'll ask you to repeat a certain word, right? and ask you to raise your hand and say, yeah, does that make sense? Raise your hand and say, yes, play along, not because I want to start some religious revival session here, right? I did that once and ended up in midget tossing. Not a good thing, right? <laughs> it's just because I want to keep you active, standing up here and there, digging the, the grooves in deeper by shouting out certain words that are important words here. So here's the deal. I have, let me just take this off here, get comfortable, right? Something's sticking up here, one second. All right, something's sticking up there. All right, anyway, so here's the deal. 
I invented the straight line system, which most of you probably know or heard of, or have at least seen some videos on, out of sheer necessity. Because I was faced with a problem, that I had these 12 guys working for me, and their average IQ was basically Forrest Gump on three hits of LSD, right? <laughs> they were not the sharpest tools in the shed. There were no Ivy League diplomas, no members of the Lucky Sperm Club, you get it? They were the sons and daughters of Long Island and New York City's lower middle class. They were kids that had never been told by their parents that they were capable of greatness. And any greatness they naturally had in them had been literally like conditioned or beaten out of them since they were this big. First from their parents and their school teachers, the media, their own friends. By the time they made it into the boardroom when I was starting, they'd been conditioned to survive, not to thrive. And what happened was originally I was selling petty stocks to average moms and pops. And just so you understand, I'm going to go back to door to door. Because I'm going to focus on, I just want to, you got to hear the story because it's so great. But I'm going to go back to door to door, so don't worry. Because my whole life was door to door before the stock market. And even after, you're going to love this, right? But we were selling to moms and pops. And I had a system I was teaching them. It didn't have a name, but it worked well. I would teach them how to sound good, have good tonality. I'd write a script for them. And, you know, I was already a student of the game because I'd already built up another business, very large, at a young age, door-to-door -door sales, I'll tell you about that after, and it went bankrupt. So I already knew how to sell and how to train, right? And they were doing well, selling to moms and pops. $500 of stock, $1,000 of stock. Then I had an idea that changed everything. What if we could sell to rich people? I had seen it done as in the movie, very accurate, just like that, right? That whole part's very accurate. So what I did, is I tested the idea myself with my junior partner, Danny, who was played by Jonah Hill, by the way, total wild man, right? <laughs> Danny was a, and Danny and I were doing unbelievably well, making massive amounts of money calling rich people. In fact, the first time we tried it, Danny had the first sale, just numbers game, right? And his first sale was a $120,000 buy ticket. And I made on that one trade $70,000 in three minutes. 70 grand, right? And I looked out into the room of my 12 Schmendricks, so to speak, right? My 12 youngs. I said, I am going to be the richest guy in the world. All I got to do is teach these, these 12 guys to sell to rich people. And the rest, as they say, will be history. And guess what? As they also say, easier said than done. It proved to be impossible. I could not get these guys to close one sale. Yet, meanwhile, Danny and I are closing like water. My close rate is 50% or higher. Danny's is 30%. We're making tons of money. These guys, after one month, hadn't closed a sale and they wanted to quit. Well, let's go back to selling to moms and pops. And the thought of that just got me so angry. I, and, I, I, and here's the deal, just follow this for a second. We're calling the same leads, selling the same stock, same script. I'm closing 50% or better. And after four weeks, 12 guys hadn't closed one sale. It was driving me batty. I, was, I couldn't understand it, right? So we would do these marathon training sessions. And just so you know, I'm a big believer. And like I live every single day. When I'm running a sales force, I, every morning I'm in their ear giving a meeting. And in the market, we did it twice a day. But once a day, you got to get in their ear, right? And then once uh, every week or two, I give a marathon training at night. So they were so negative because, of course, when salesmen aren't closing, they get negative, right? They're like, come on, give us one of your marathons at night. So I said, fine, fine. So I, we all went home to have some dinner. We came back 7 p.m. And I looked at these guys and said, guys, what is so damn hard about this? I honestly don't get it. 
You know, I'm doing it. Danny's doing it. You could do it to what? And they're like, there's so many objections. I'm like, yeah, there's thousands of objections. And they're like, objections, objections. They keep cutting us off. And, I, and in that moment, I, I got so angry. I'm like, really? They said, yeah, there's thousands of objections. I'm like, really? Thousands? They're like, thousands. I go, great, let's write them all down. I want to hear all thousand because I'll show you how to come one by one, overcome them. I'm like, let's go, come on. I'm not moving forward until you list them. So, of course, there's a bit of silence at first, right? They're scared to jump over and choke them, right? So, finally, one guy says, they want to think about it. I said, great. They want to think about it. I wrote, think about it. Give me another one. Someone goes, they want to call back. I said, great, call back. What else? They got to speak to their wife. Great, they got to speak to their wife. Their business partner, right? What else? It's a bad time of year. Right, they don't know me, right? And on and on. I thought, guys, we got seven. You need 993 more to go. Let's keep going. I want them all. And they kept going, and they kept going, and they kept going until they had exhausted every objection. And there was freaking 12 of them on the board. <laughs> 12 objections. And in that, and by the way, Half of them were repeats. There were, I need to speak to someone else, as in my wife, my partner, my accountant, my lawyer, Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, right? Or it's a bad time of year. It's back to school time. It's Christmas time. It's Groundhog's Day. It's freaking leap year, right? And in that moment, I, I just got so angry and something came over me. Something came over me, and, and, and I don't know, have you read, anyone read the book, Think and Grow Rich? It's, you, you gotta read this book, After Way of the Wolf. <laughs> anyway, but no, seriously, right? And the Wolf of Wall Street, right? Who read the, by the way, Wolf of Wall Street, the book? Right? Who's seen the movie? Everybody. <laughs> Welcome to modern society, right? Anyway, they talk about something called the collective unconscious. Like this ability to tap in to information and thoughts and ideas that really aren't even your own. And you see this very often. It's most apparent in like the music world where you'll have a guy like a one, like some band will come together and for like one year they make the most amazing music ever and they can never do it again. Something happens sometimes and you, this window of clarity opens up and if you know the rules of success, you jump through and make hay when the sun shines. Well, what happened was my window of clarity opened up and something hit me. And I looked at these guys and I uttered these five magic words. Like, don't you guys get it? Every sale is the same. And they're like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm like, every sale is the same. Watch, it's a straight line. And for the very first time, I drew this long, thin line on the center of the board and put a big, thick X on either end. I said, this is your open, this is your close, and now let me stop here. And I want to go back to the beginning and tell you my story of my life, but tell you in a way that focuses on the key moments, the lessons that led me up to this moment when I was able to tap in, because what happened is, over the next three hours, I invented the straight line, like I never thought of it before, this, this vision popped in my head, and these 12 guys, who literally couldn't close a damn door, before that, the next morning, went on an account opening spree, that's now been the subject of two motion pictures, first Boiler Room, and then The Wolf of Wall Street, right? And within three months, they were millionaires, and I was making a million bucks a week, and I lost my, lost my stuff, man. I lost it. I went wild. I mean, listen, I played out. And by the way, there's also a lot to be learned on the, on the other side, what not to do. Because I was very young. I did my ethics. You know, I was raised well, but I just made, I was poor family, and the money came in so fast. I lost my ethical way, because, and by the way, and I paid the price, I'm lucky I came back, and thankfully, you know, I'm sober now for 30 years, I'm 25 years ago. 
which is a miracle to itself. I, I think I look pretty good considering I should look like Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, right? <laughs> but I, I look okay. I got to hydrate, though. If my wife was here, she'd be holding up an iPad. Hydrate. Hydrate. Drink. This is my water. It's Red Bull. Because I don't do drugs. I can't do cocaine. I drink Red Bull, you know? <laughs> now I lecture to people. I kid around about drugs, but it's, it's, a, it's a terrible, really is a terrible thing. I don't judge, but for me, you know, it, it, it almost destroyed my life, right? Anyway, let me go back to the beginning now. Tell you what happened in my life. What led me to this moment? It's and basically, I was one of these like born salesmen, entrepreneurs from the time I emerged my mother's womb. At the age of eight, I had a paper out, and I was knocking on doors to expand it. And I had my first great door-to-door -door lesson at the age of eight. Before I got the route, I was apprenticing for some other older kid who went off to college and he gave me the route. So for three months before that, I had made a list as I delivered his papers and made nothing as an apprentice, right? That was foolish, right? I made a list of every single door that didn't have a newspaper on it, saying this is a perfect lead source, right? So I, I'm watching, I said, I'm out there each day, right? I walk up and say, I like to get close to everybody, right? So I'm, I, I'm out there, I'm making a list of every single door that doesn't have a paper, I'm the perfect people, right? So I have a really long list. Uh-oh, let me see if I can do this. It might start reverberating in my own head, right? <clears throat> Anyway, so I make this list, right, and I start knocking on door after door after door, right? In a week, I haven't opened up even one person. Not even one. I was flipping out. I was like in tears. I was a kid, right? Either they weren't home or they didn't want newspapers, right? And my parents, just so you know, my parents are not the sort of like sales-oriented people. In fact, in my family, the word salesman was synonymous with these two words, slime and bucket. My parents hated salesmen. How proud they are now, right? Anyway. <laughs> but luckily, my friends, let me walk away from here. Luckily, my friend's father was in marketing and a sales guy, and he saw how upset I was. I was really, you know, I wanted to be rich from the time I can remember, right? He's like, what's wrong? Tell me, I said, you know, I'm not gonna always, I tell him the whole story about how I planned everything out, and he starts laughing at me. I'm like, what's so funny? He goes, you're knocking on the wrong doors. I'm like, what do you mean? These are all the people who don't get papers. He goes, exactly. He says, Jordan, there are two types of people in this world. There are those that want to get the newspaper delivered, and there are those who don't. And right now, you're knocking on all the doors of those who don't. That's why they're not getting the paper. You think you're the first paper boy to canvas this, this building? <laughs> There's been a hundred paper boys before you have done all the hard work. Because here's what I want you to do. Tomorrow, I want you to follow around the guy from the New York Times and the Daily News. And every time he drops a paper, make a note. And I want you to go to those doors and sell them the post as well. Because people will buy more than one paper. People will shop in more than one dress shop. People will buy more than one car. There's buyers and there's non-buyers. I was trying to turn non-buyers into buyers. You get it? Sure enough, I made my list. I went down, had like a 70% closing rate, and I was great at it right from the start. As soon as they would see me, because just remember what happened. So all these, let's, let's take it through a slow down because it's an important lesson out there in the field. I'm going to all these doors, right? And there's not a paper because they all work. There's no one home ever. No one's ever home with these, in these homes, right? So I'm getting all no answers, no answers, no answers, right? Hitting the wrong doors. Once I switched to attacking people that were in the business of buying what I was selling, I closed almost every person I spoke to. And my paper route expanded, and I was like, that's it, I'm going to be the richest kid. And then my mother stepped in. The great killjoy, I love her to death, she's still alive, we're very close, right? She thought, she was, her worst nightmare is I'm going to become a vacuum cleaner salesman going, she thought, I because I wasn't doing my homework, I just want to knock on doors all day. She made me sell the route to a neighbor for $50, and I retired into the sunset, a rich man at nine. Nine and a half, right? 
but my retirement didn't last long. Back in the day, I'm older than you guys, most of you at least, right? It used to snow like crazy in New York. This is before Al Gore invented global warming, right? And the internet, right? It would snow 30 inches all, right? So it snows one day, I'm looking out, and my dad goes down to like shovel his car. We lived in an apartment building, we didn't have money. But about a half a mile or so, a mile down the road, was the rich people. I said, I know what I'll do. I bundled up, I went out and bought a snow shovel for $3, and started knocking on people's doors. Hey, would you like your driveway shovel for 20 bucks? Sure, why not, young boy? I'm so nice and young. <laughs> I was like, this big, right? Made a ton of money. And then, of course, Al Gore screwed me. He invented global warming, and it stopped snowing, right? And that was that. Out of business again. Next stop, I'm watching TV, and I see David Copperfield. And this guy makes the Statue of Liberty disappear. I'm like, I gotta be a magician. And I heard he had a hot girlfriend. I'm like, this is my guy. I gotta be this guy, right? So I decide to put an ad in the local penny saver for like eight cents or something. I figure no one will call me. The phone starts ringing off the hook. I don't know how to do magic tricks, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I panic. I go, Dad, I made a mistake. He's like, all right, and by the way, my parents are interested. They, they never will like me at all. And they always said like, you know, I'm like, you know, like I was kidnapped by aliens, the chip was in play, they put me back in the family, right? Because I'm not like them. And, but he was always supportive, like you would never leave me hanging out there. He took me down to a magic shop in New York City called Lewis Tannen. We'd buy some tricks and within a few weeks, I became the amazing Belfort. And I actually started doing children's parties up until the age of 16, made a lot of money. And that's when I really hit it big for the first time. Anybody here from New York? New Yorkers in the house? My brethren, Jones Beach during the summer is a public beach in New York. On a hot summer sunny day is a million people there. Blanket to blanket to blanket, they've been packed, right? Long beach, long walk to the concession stand, and I'm at the shoreline with my buddies, and I'm watching how everybody is bitching and moaning, oh my God, it's such a long walk, right? So I said, I got what would happen if I just snuck down there with some ice cream and some ices, right? It's a good idea. No one was doing it, right? Next one, I took out, you guys, young guys, don't even know what this is. I took out something called the Yellow Pages, right? They don't exist anymore, probably, right? And I found some crazy Greek distributor for good humor ice cream. I went down there. I bought a cooler for 50, a styrofoam cooler for $7. I loaded it up with a barrel of Italian ices, chip witches, fudgicles, Milky Way, stickers, put a thing of dry ice on top, went down to the beach, walked along the shore and said, Italian ice is chip. I sold it out in one hour and made $120. The year was 1978. Minimum wage was like 95 cents. I made 120 bucks in an hour and it changed my life. Changed my life. I, but by the way, so what do you think I did the next day? I went back with four coolers the next day and I carried them all down. Now here's a lesson to never forget. And there's so much I'd love to teach you here, you know, but let me, quick as I can. I'm a, I'm a guy, my friends are everything to me. I've always been having the good friends, my buddies, my mate, they're everything, right? So Jones Beach is too big, there's no competition. So I said to all my friends, guys, come work with me. It's the easiest thing. We meet girls, there's music, you get tan, you get workout, right? So all my friends, yeah, yeah, let's go. I took four of my friends down there, and every day I go out there and make five, six hundred dollars per day. It's like three grand a day now. And my three other friends would sell one cooler and stop. Only one of them, a guy who was actually in the movie, nicknamed, he was, his nickname was the Penguin, because he walked with like a stick up, he'd go in the penguin, right, waddle around, right? He called him like the, 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 the swordfisher in the movie, there he was, right? The point is, is that one of my friends worked like I did, all day long till the sunset, while the rest would stop. I'm a four or five cooler guy. They were one cooler guys. Why is that? Like to me, it was like, it's outlandish. It was, it's got, it's really outlandish. How could, I wanted to go to college, I wanted to be rich, I wanted to pay my own way, I wanted to get a car. And I did all those things, I put myself through school, I had a nice car, I lived well. 
was awesome. The, the beach changed my life. And it also defined who I was, at least who I thought and my beliefs about myself. And if I work hard, I get the result. So let me very quickly, I have to deviate and give you some, some quick instruction here just so you understand the concept, all right? There's two worlds of success. There's an inner and an outer world. Yin, yang, up, down, left, right. Yes, there's a, the world physically is duality. In every, not just selling or success, everything we do, there's two sides to every coin. There's ones, there's zeros, there's yes, there's no. Start, stop, above, beneath. Why would it be any different in success? It's not, it's exactly the same. In success and sales, so well, let's, let's morph them together. So we call it the, is this fucking paint? Oh, excuse my language, sorry. That slipped out, I apologize. Know thy audience, I apologize, right? <laughs> I can let them go when I have to, but I really don't anymore, right? And anyway, you have two worlds. You have what's called the inner world of success and the outer. Inner is what happens up here. It's your success mindset. Everything that happens before you go out into the world, take action, and then you have the outer. Pretty basic, right guys? Everyone knows this, right? But sometimes we forget because it starts up here. There are four distinctions on the inner world. Number one, the ability to manage your state, to be in an empowered state. There are certain states that lead to success, to be certain, clear, clarity, all right? Courage, confidence, the four C's. Then we have your belief systems, the beliefs you have about yourself, about your capabilities, about what's good in the world, what's right, what's wholesome, what's not. And we act and process the world based on those beliefs. There's certain sets of beliefs called empowering beliefs that lead us to massive success. And there is limiting beliefs that hold us back. And the best metaphor, quick, is like a Ferrari. Imagine a Ferrari, right? And it's, you know, 600,000 bucks, beautiful cherry red chassis, 12 cylinders, four valves per, you can go 300 miles an hour. But if there's a governor on the engine, stopping the flow of gas, I don't care how fast it could go, it's not going over 55. That's what a limiting belief does, just one. It stops you from charging forward when you should, causes you to pull back when you shouldn't, and we all have them, all of us, including me. If you don't think you have one, guess what? You just found your first limiting belief. We all have them, and we gotta root them out. Now, some of us are really good at doing it on the fly, and we succeed, but we worry we fall sick inside, we don't feel fulfilled, so there's better and more elegant ways. Separate subject, right? Moving forward, we have what's called vision focus. I don't have time to do this, I try to make, you know, think about a year from now, to create a vision for your future. Understand this, people will never follow you because you have a goal. Human beings follow vision. Every human being is thirsty for a vision. And if they don't have one, they gravitate towards someone who has one. You gotta become a visionary in your own life, bottom line. Now there's two sides to this, because see, connecting to your vision, you have goals. Your vision sits on top of your goals. And your goals show you whether you're moving in the right direction or wrong direction but it's your vision that you're emotionally connected to. The other side of this coin is the competency is called vision focus. Training yourself to focus on your vision versus what you're afraid of. People, human beings as a species, we tend to focus on our fears and what's wrong and the universal laws what you focus on, you move towards, and what you focus on, you attract. The law of attraction, it does work, not like the secret says, but it does work in a practical way where if you take action and move towards what you want. So what we need to learn to do is to focus on our vision with laser-guided precision with one eye while we constantly scan the horizon for other opportunities. You don't want to have tunnel vision. Because I promise you that when you really get rich one day, it's not going to be in the way you thought. It's the opportunities that pop up, the little tweaks that you make, the pivots. That's having bifurcated focus. One eye on the vision, 
other opportunities that are getting integrated into your vision. You don't throw out your vision, but you integrate in. Your vision's a living, breathing, growing animal. The goals are what connect you from today to where you want to go. And your emotional attachment. Does that make sense? Yes? Perfect, okay? And then lastly, and the one I've been trying to get to here, is called your standards. We all have our personal standards, not just for money, but let's talk about money. What is your financial standard? What amount of money will you not settle for less than? Me, if I'm not making 10 million plus a year, I am, I'm, I'm not feeling good. I'm, not, I'm, I'm antsy. Now, by the way, that's not right or wrong. And if your vision, if your standard is to make 100,000 a year, it's gonna be tough to live a good life. But let's say it's 500 a year, it's really not wrong or right. But the question is this, is your standard congruent with your vision? There's many people out there, I know them well, because I fire them after a week or two of working with me. They have champagne visions and beer standards. Your standard is what you must make, your, what you must have financially, and we'll always get that. We'll keep working, we'll keep going. It's like a thermostat in your house. You hit the, the, the right temperature, what happens? You shut off, you cool down. It's too low, it picks back up. That's your standard, your set point for money and success. I was a four cooler guy. I had a high standard and it was congruent with my vision. I wanted to be rich, I wanted to have a big life, the whole thing, right? So I'm not gonna tell you your set point is wrong. What I want you to ask yourself is does it match my vision? Some people have, a, and I bet you there's a lot of you here like this. Wish I can get my hands on you for a long time because you have really high standards. I bet most of you do. That's why you're here. But you don't quite have this vision clarified yet. You don't really have, you have goals and stuff, but you, you know, it's about, too much about money and not about the people. Your vision, just so you understand the power of your vision, and I'll close with that. Remember me, I'll loop back in the end, but it's not about you. It's about other things that are bigger than you, people that you love unconditionally, the causes you believe in. We'll always do more for other people than for ourselves, bottom line. So when you have an unclear vision and high standards, you feel empty and antsy and you know, you're making money, you're working hard, but there's a lack of fulfillment to the whole thing. Your life's not running on all cylinders. When you have congruency between these two things, wow, it, it, it's just, it's just an amazing, you're in flow. And by the way, any person in this room is capable of doing it. I'll tell you why. And I'm, I'm dead serious. Because there's two types of people in the world. You have what are called reason people. People will tell you all the damn reasons why they can't get what they want in life. You give them the best opportunity, oh, it's too expensive, oh, I'll have to travel somewhere, oh, I'll have to spend time with my, ah. I call them ducks, quack, quack, quack. They float around in a duck pond with duck poop. You know, they never go anywhere, quack. And, and you see them all the time, like, I watch them as they talk, I'm like, their bills go quack, quack, quack. It's a, it's a duck-like mentality. They have this impossibility notion. If you want to go find some, just go to motor vehicles. You'll find a lot of people working there. Ah, sorry, I can't do that. Sorry, all right. And on the other side of the equation, you have what are called results people. People that get stuff done. They get results. I call them the eagles. I didn't make this up, by the way. You probably heard it from others. The eagles, because they soar. They make a way, they find a way, but they'll get where they got to go. Eagles find a way, ducks wallow around in the duck pond with the duck poop, they never go anywhere fast, and they'll tell you all the reasons why, and it's what it is, it's their story. The ducks have a story, and to them, that story is real. All the reasons why they can't get what they want. And the irony is, is that it's that story that they tell themselves that stops them from getting what they want. Because the story stops them from getting honest 
which is, you know what, pal? You got some work to do. If you want to succeed and live a first-class life, you got to educate yourself, you got to grow yourself, you got to work really, really hard. No one's handing you anything in this world. If you think so, I'm going to let me wake you up now. I've tried. I really, if it's someone else to make me rich, it doesn't work. Self-reliance. Once you realize that it's within your power to go out and make the world the way you want, and, you, and you're willing to commit to learning the skills and working your tail off, you're unstoppable and you feel great. Now, there is not one duck in this room. You know how I know that? I'll tell you how, let me take a sip. The reason I know that <clears throat> is because ducks don't come to these rooms. They won't come. It's like the movie The Omen. They try to bring Damien, the devil child, into church. He's like, ah, he screams, right? The duck won't come here. I'm a duck's worst nightmare to tell you the truth. I, I speak the truth about success. Hard work, self-reliance, learning the skills of success, no shortcuts, but you get rich quick. I believe in getting rich quick. But it's like you work really hard, don't get the result. You work really hard, don't result. It's you're lining up the elements of success. You work hard and bam, when that last piece comes in, the money pours in. That's what life is really all about. So I know there are no ducks here. You're all eagles, but here's the truth. Many of you, less so here than the average room, but some of you, you've had your wings clipped. Something happened along the way. So you were born an eagle, maybe you went to work for the wrong company the first time, someone whispered something in your ear, you're not meant for sales, you're not good enough for something wrong, and you developed a limiting belief, maybe having problems with your state management, maybe you just don't know how to close. There are some weird people out there in the world, like me, they're called born closers. I'm a born closer. I didn't have to figure it out. My brain was wired in that weird way that it allowed me to just know intuitively what to do. And I bet you there's a bunch of you in here. Raise your hand if you're a born closer. Yeah, there's a lot more here. Ready? Give yourself a round of applause. Come on. What I did with the straight line was I somehow figured out how to dissect my own strategy as a born closer, and I allowed it to be essentially used by some people who weren't, and it turned them into the same level of closing. That's what the straight line does, the flash forward. So anyway, for all of you, whether it was a, the wrong job, a bad, you know, we live in a world, excuse my French, where shit happens. You know, you're walking along the street, you're doing everything right, and bam, you get, it happens. You live in that world. Sometimes it's our own fault, like me. I made mistakes. I stepped over the line, and I deserved what I got. But sometimes, it's not your fault, really. It's a cruel, tough world, and it's not fair. And what happens is, we get our wings clipped, so we're still eagles, but we start thinking like ducks. We start lowering our standards. We forget about that vision that we had that once was so bold and bright and clear and our life we're gonna have. You know what? I'm here to give you your wings back. Bottom line. That's what I do, all right? And it starts with understanding these two worlds. On the other side, you have what's called the rules of business and entrepreneurship. Business has rules. Let me tell you, go well, forward. So I made all this money, I went to college, and my mother, because from the time I was two years old, sitting in the high chair, my mom was spoon feeding me applesauce, and she's saying the only noble way to be rich is to be a doctor. You gotta be a doctor. As the applesauce went in, doctor, a dentist, I'm like, doctor, it's like hypnosis, right? <laughs> when I got out of college, right? I didn't know what, I didn't know, can you guys hear me? Uh, oh, hello, yeah, good. So, when I graduated from college, I was probably like you guys. So I'd say, what do you wanna do for a living? I wanna be rich for a living. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be rich. So, you know, I couldn't go to medical school. I mean, eight more, I'd kill myself with eight more years of school. I couldn't do it. So I figured, you know, dentists make a lot of money. My mom had, his brother was, he was really rich. So I said, you know, I'll just be a dentist, right? 
I applied to dental school, very good grades. I got in. So I'm all proud and happy. The first day of orientation, I go down to Maryland, <coughs> University of Maryland, right? Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. I get in front of the uh, dean, there's 110 of us in an auditorium. The dean gets up, he's a white haired guy, white jacket, very dental looking, right? And he's like, I want to welcome you all to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. You should be proud to be here. Dentistry is a wonderful profession. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, so far, so good. And I'm looking around, trying to size up the competition, you know? And they look pretty bright eyed and bush tailed, right? And then I'm like, so far, he goes, but let me say this the golden age of dentistry is over. If you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. Like, what the hell? I'm in the wrong place. I got up and I left. I dropped out. Just like that, the first day. <laughs> you should have seen the look on the face of the other kids when I walked out. I never went back. Of course, I didn't tell it to my mother. <laughs> She's like, how's school? I'm like, oh, it's great, Mom. I felt bad, right? I lied. I felt compelled. It was a white lie, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it was the first of many over a few years, right? <clears throat> What's wrong with your eyes? Nothing. I have, my back is hurting. I have a bad back, Mom. You know, uh, right? <laughs> anyway, so I drop out, and I have to now go back to New York to move in with my parents. You know, for the movie, I can assure you it was no picnic, right? And I answer a blind ad in the paper. It says, action, make a thousand dollars a week. This is 83, 84, right? 85. So it's like, like 2,000 or 3,000 a week now, right? 1,000 a week, company vehicle. My company vehicle? Well, this is great. I go down there. It's a warehouse. And I see these guys running around with pickup trucks and freezer boxes. They're selling meat and seafood. I'm like, what is this? The restaurant? No, no, it's not restaurants. It's door to door. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, we'll put you through the training program. I said, okay. I said, I get a truck. Yeah, you get a truck. I'm like, all right, great. So they said, all right, we're going to introduce you to this guy. And his name is Eddie. SS is our top salesman here. And Eddie will take you through the ropes. And tomorrow, you get your own truck. So we're going through the, the, you know, the courses here as he's driving me to some neighborhood up in Westchester County. And Eddie says to me, listen, the key to the whole thing is you got to stay pumped and positive. When you're out there in the field, you can never get negative because once they see a sweat, you can't close a deal. And also, whatever they say to you, no matter how rude they are or how nasty, just say, have a nice day. I'm like, why? He goes, because it makes you feel better about yourself. I'm like, all right. <laughs> whatever, right? So he goes, just follow me. I'm the master, right? So we drive up. We pull up. The, we first, we're doing both homes, private homes and storefronts, right? For the owners of the stores or people, work, people working there, right? First door he knocks on, bam, bam. Hi, my name's Eddie. I go, slam. He's like, have a nice day, right? He goes, no problem. Don't worry about that, right? We go, next one. Knock, knock, knock. And he's got this, like, you know, proud walk and everything. He's like, you know, the closer's knock, right? Door opens, hi, my name's Eddie. I don't mean to. Slam. He's like, have a nice day. Don't worry about it. Well, you ever been in a cold neighborhood? <laughs> Who's been in a cold neighborhood, right? Eddie was in a cold neighborhood. Nobody wanted the food, as the phrase went, right? Three hours later, he knocked on 75 doors. He hadn't sold one box. He hadn't got a single pitch off. And every time he get out of that truck and he woke up with his chest out, knock, knock, knock. You know, hi, my name's Eddie. I was impressed, right? And then somewhere around 12.30, 1 o'clock, he gets out of the truck. He looks and goes, Phew, tough day. He's like, Drops his shoulders, he walks up, and he goes up to the next door, his head's hung low, he's shaking his head, he's like, Melody, I go, hope they don't answer us, they don't reject me. The woman opens the door, it's a kind look, and he goes, you wouldn't want any filet mignon and shrimp or lobster tails, right? I mean, the last 35 people just slammed the door, so I assume you're gonna do the same thing too, right? He didn't say those words, he didn't have to. And you know what I'm talking about. This audience knows what I'm, you didn't have, it was in every enunciation body line. I was like, oh my, like, oh my God. What, it was like the food was poison he was acting like. I'm like, I'm like, does he know? You know, you don't remember everything you see in life. I, 
This experience, I would never forget. I would never forget it. And it shaped a, a, much of in terms of the inner game of state management. I was like, wow. I will never let that happen to me. And of course, Eddie went out for form. He didn't sell one box the first day. Not even one box, right? All right, fair enough, right? <clears throat> Next day I go back to the right, Eddie had a bad day. I said, oh, I still want to do it. They gave me 35 boxes of meat, right? You're supposed to sell five boxes a day, right? You know, six days, seven days, whatever it is, right? I say, go out and do your thing. So I get in my truck, right? I drive up to a wealthy neighborhood in Westchester. I figure they'll be rich, they can afford a lot of food, right? First door, I knock on, big house, right? Knock on the door. I guess, you know, nice woman comes down. I said, hi, my name's Jordan. I'm meet and see with your neighbors here. I have some extra boxes on the truck. I'll give you everything in a really good deal. She goes, what do you got? I said, well, come on out. The first woman bought 13 boxes of meat from me. The first <laughs> And you know what happened? It was like an out-of-body experience. I was like, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't know I had this talent. Like, I knew I sounded good. Like, did you ever feel like you knew you sounded I was like, oh my God, Eureka, I've arrived. Like, think about it. Beach, hard work, drive. Papers, hard work, drive. I, this was sales. And I had the gift of all gifts. I could, the words were coming out perfectly. I knew how to, what to smile. I just, it just all, and, and you know what I'm saying exactly. This room knows what I'm saying, right? I almost sold the woman the truck. The whole, she offered to buy the truck from me. The first day, I sold the entire truck. I came back without one box of meat, all right? The owner, name of the company, and if anyone remembers here is Great American Meat and Seafood, I still get calls, but people remember this. They're like, what did you, did you give, what did you do? Did you sell it to family, friends? I said, no, strangers. They're like, come on, I'm like, strangers. They thought I went to my family, right? I'm like, I would never go. I wouldn't sell this crappy meat to my family, right? <laughs> yeah. Meat was actually pretty good, right? <laughs> anyway, the first, and, I, and, and by the way, the single most boxes sold today was like 15 or something. I sold 30. The first week, I sold 275 boxes, and I shattered the industry record. And I was so good at it. Like, I just, like, literally, every, like, and I'll tell you some great stories. I have to go. Can I go, like, 15 minutes over? Is it cool? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much I could teach you guys. I wanna, and I love you guys. You're awesome. So anyway, so anyway, long story short. I'm breaking all the records. They're sending out their salesmen for me to train, and guess what happens? The whole office starts doing better because the belief, they start seeing what I'm doing, right? They ask me to start giving some meetings. So I look at one of my friends. I asked my, my friend Elliot come, from the beach, come right? I said, what are we working for these morons for? H half the stuff is out of stock. Let's open up our own meat and seafood company, which we did with one truck, and I used the profits from my own sales, and I bought a second truck, and then a third truck, and a fourth truck. Before I knew it, I had 26 trucks on the road. I was 22 years old, driving a 911 with a phone. My first fo a cell phone back in 1985. All the people you know I'm talking about. I got the first bill, I almost ran out of town. To it. It's like 7,000, I was like, ah! <laughs> Ripped the phone out of the car back then, right? And I arrived as a businessman, because I was rocking and rolling, making a ton of money, I thought. <laughs> but I was actually making every mistake a young entrepreneur can make. I was overexpanding, I was undercapitalized, I was growing on credit, I wasn't screening out my employees. Half my guys, they take the trucks, they come, they were smoking crack under a bridge. I'd be like, where's the guy? I don't know. Hey, you come in, the guy be, ah. <sighs> I knew nothing about business, guys. You don't go come into the world knowing how to run a business. And they don't teach in college, God forbid, right? That's what we learn. <laughs> business has rules. If you break those rules, you're gonna feel massive pain. And I did. When the barbecue season ended, the business slowed down. As I said very quickly, the business owners know I was growing on credit. So as I expanded my receipt, my, my payables got bigger, but I got the cash 30 days. I was growing on the cash and all of a sudden the cash flow dried up and the bills came down and what? I was like the proverbial 
Dutch, he's Dutch by the way, my friend. He's from, I was like, I needed Syrian to put his finger in the dike. It was springing leaks everywhere. And just like that, I was out of business and had to declare personal bankruptcy. I co-signed for all 26 trucks and everything collapsed. They, had my, they took my Porsche, they towed, it was the saddest day of my then life, they towed it away, right? About a week or two later, I was just didn't know what to do, and I'm in my neighborhood, local neighborhood now, at the bottom of my emotions, and I hear this story about some kid who I had grown up with named Michael Falk. Now, just so you understand, Michael Falk was the kid that no one wanted to play with. He had a weird smell, you know the funny smelling houses, right? I'm not playing that kid's house. His grandmother would chase him with a broom, you know, weird grandmother, right? He was a weird kid with pimples on his face. And I hear this rumor. He's making a million dollars a year as a stockbroker. I'm like, that can't be possible. A million, I'm like, wait, 20,000 a week? I'm like, it's impossible. I didn't have five dollars in my pocket, right? A few days later, I'm in the park. He comes up in a Ferrari with a thousand dollar suit on and a beautiful blonde. I'm like, I want the car. I want the blonde. I want, I'm like, oh my God. I say, Michael. I'm like, Mike, what do you think? He goes, oh, I'm a stockbroker. I made a million two last year. Um, and the best thing about a stockbroker is the first they'll tell you is the income. Oh yeah, I made a million bucks. It's a million days. Money, 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 right? And here's what I said to myself, which I'm sure many of you have said to yourselves at least once in your life. If that moron can make a million dollars a year, I can make 10. <laughs> yes or yes? So I answered an ad in the paper. I had to go down to Wall Street and sell myself a job because let's just say my resume was not looking so good at this point. I was a dental school dropout who just declared bankruptcy. Hire me, right? So I get in there and it's true as the movie says, when I got into the interview, I started pitching the guy's stock right in the interview. Even that, what I was saying, I was just trying to impress the guy. And the guy goes, whoa, 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 calm down. He goes, this is the, I never see anything like this. He goes, either one of two things are going to happen to you. Either you're going to be the most famous broker in Wall Street history, or you'll end up in jail. The guy was a genius. He was right on both accounts, right? <laughs> and he hires me. And for six months, I cold called and slaved away, making 80 bucks a week. And you know what I did at nighttime? I went door to door into the buildings and sold jewelry door to door to pay my rent. I was with wife number one back then. She's like four wives. I have not done well in the wife department, I admit. Okay? So I'm not teaching you relationship mastery. This is sales mastery. Right? You go to Tony Robbins for that, right? I'm a sales trip. <laughs> Anyway, she was great wife, number one, right? And finally, and, but here's a great lesson, guys, is that even though I was broke and destitute, those days dialing the phone were some of the happiest of my life. You know why? Because I knew. I knew I could blow them all the way. I said, just, nope, I'll pay my dues. I saw what Mark Hanna was making. He said, I'll make more than I was ready to roll. And everybody knew it. Everyone there knew it. I sound them. They, I had a reputation there, right? Finally, my day comes. My first day, October 19th, 1987, Black Monday. And I watch in shock and awe as the market goes down 508 points. My first day. And just like that, L.F. Rothschild, a firm that was in a business for 112 years shuts down and I'm out of a job. And that was, I, mean, I couldn't even believe it. And that's how I ended up at that small firm. And now let me just collapse time here. Let me skip through a few things here, right? And let's get, because I, I want to you know, give you guys the straight line learning as much as I can. So, <clears throat> let me take one sip and I'll jump ahead like three years. <laughs> Obviously, as you can guess, the first time I picked up the phone to sell stock, I was the greatest stock. I, I just had a gift, I did. And every, it was just like the movie. They all stopped, like, what the hell? And the whole room gathered around. This is before I invented the straight line, but I was still using it without knowing it. Like all of you who don't know, some of you know the straight line. How many of you use the straight line? Says a lot of you, right? Yeah, I mean, but even if you're not using it, you're using it, you just don't know it. 
because it's just basic. It's just it's how you go about getting someone to buy. Where the straight line is, it's just a very regimented way. It just works. It's just it's amazing, right? It really is. It's a you know, everyone should have one invention in their life. That was mine, okay? That and my God's creation, my children, who I love more than anything, right? The greatest things in my life, right? My kids a lot more than the straight line. But it was a great thing. And let me go back. I gotta just fast forward here. I start my own firm. I go to the small firm. Same process. I say the guys are more, and I'll start my own. Except this time. See, here's the thing about failure. The lessons are in the failures, guys. All right? See, that meat business, whoo, I went to Harvard, Yale, and the College of Hard Knocks all in one. What I learned from that business, boy, when I started Stratton and I walked into the room with the lawyers, they're like, what, did you go to business school? I'm like, no. I knew. I really knew my stuff now. Because I felt the pain, not like the pain of failure to nail in the lesson, right? About everything. And I did it exactly right, kept my expenses low, the whole thing, made all the right moves, right? And that was that magic moment I invented the straight line. And then it just went nuts because what happened was these kids who couldn't close the door, they started telling their friends, and their friends started coming in. First, they came from Long Island and New York, then from all over the country. Every day, kids would line up at my door. And just, you know, say, swear loyalty, I'll teach you the straight line, make you rich. And it worked for many years. Then it got corrupted with greed. Seriously, greed. I'm the first person to admit it wasn't drugs. I wish I could say it was drugs. It was greed. So be careful. Because success without ethics and integrity is not success, guys. It's just not, seriously, okay? Really. <laughs> I wouldn't change a thing because it's my life. Because my, and I have no regrets because that's not a way to live. But of course, if I could do it again, I would, you know, you know you'd want to, you know, people would not lose money and stuff. But the point is, is that you have to learn from your mistakes and grow from it, not dwell on them and be disempowered. But let me spend, we have about three minutes, I'm going to go over a little bit. Is that okay if I go over? Yeah. Real good? We good? Can I give them an extra 10 minutes? Is that okay? Good. All right. Good. <laughs> I'd love to come back, by the way, and do a longer training one day, but I'm, you know. Anyway, there's other people to speak. Here's the deal. Here's what, in essence, what the straight line is, guys. It's goal or Oh my God, wait, I stop. I got to tell you one thing. I'm sorry. I, when the, after I went to jail, let me just tell you real quick, right? I sold mortgages door to door. Do you know I was making $100,000 a day? in the refi boom, $100,000 they myself. I walk house to house, business to business, and say, hey, my name is Jordan, I'm a mortgage broker, what rate are you paying? That's how simple the pitch was. And they'd say, no, I'm saying, really? Oh my God. It's all in the body language, the way you smile, the eye, guys, it, door to door, it's so, it, it's the greatest, you know, dude, I love door to door sales, I love it. It's really, it's, it is. <laughs> You know why? You don't need a penny in marketing money. You could do it all through. The government had just taken all my money. It was after Stratton. I had nothing. How did I start myself? Door to door sales. That's how I started. I went, I saw an opportunity in mortgage. I said, I said no one was crazy enough to go door to door. No one had ever heard the pitch before. Imagine, you're like, mortgage broker? I've heard everyone, combs, brushes, electronics. Well, yeah, what are you paying? Nine. And I could tell you stories. I had people that, like, I walk into, like, I throw every person out here. Why am I talking and they buy from me anyway, right? Because of certain things I was doing, my tonality, my body language. I just want to tell you that story. So anyway, let's get back to the straight line. The straight line is goal-oriented communication. What I mean by that is you look backwards and say, okay, I just closed the sale. What had to line up? Like, what caused that to happen? You know, there's an open, there's an open, and there's, a, let me start with a fresh sheet that can get paid. You have an open and you have a close, right? And every once in a while, you get one of those, that's, my, that's a fucking, that's a straight line, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> An artist, I'm not, okay? <laughs> straight. That's a straight line beyond drugs, right? So, this is your open, this is your close, right? And every once in a while, you get one of those perfect laid down sales where everything you say and everything you do, they're almost pre-sold, 
Who's ever had one of those, right? The problem is they're far and few between. Most of the time, your prospect tries to take you off the straight line. They have questions, they have objections, they start to ramble. So what you have is these healthy boundaries above and below the line. When you're inside these boundaries, you're in control of the sale, in control. When you're outside the boundaries, you're out of control, spiraling off the Pluto or down here to your anus, not a good place to be, okay? In control, out of control. What I said to my guys that night, I said, guys, I, I realized, like, I realized what happened. There was something about the way I was speaking in my voice and the way I would group my words that instantly I was being perceived a certain way. See, they, they said a couple things to me. They said, there's so many objections. Uh, they also said, we keep getting cut off. We can't even get our pitch off. I'm like, what? I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, no one cuts me off. I'm, but like, they haven't been asked for the order yet. What, how are they getting objections before they ask for the order? And it hit me. And I'm like, I'm like guys, people don't cut me. I said, when you're on the phone, or especially in person, and the phone, it's four seconds. Person, it's a quarter of a second. It's like less than a second. To establish three crucial things, or you're done. You can't influence anyone. I'll tell you exactly what they are. In those first few seconds, you must be perceived as being number one, sharp as attack, sharp, on the ball, a problem solver, so it doesn't waste time. Number two, enthusiastic as hell. That what you have must be good, enthusiasm. And number three, an expert in your field. An expert in your field. We have been conditioned, this is the key here guys, since we're yay big, to defer to experts. When we went to a doctor, he had the diploma on the wall, he'd say, ask your questions, he'd tell you to do whatever he told you to do, you bent over if he told you to bend over, right? We've been taught to essentially Defer to experts. We seek them out to solve our problems, and we've been taught since we're this big. When you're in the presence of an expert, or someone that you think is an expert, you let them guide the process. What was happening is I would get on the phone or in person, and I had a certain way of talking, making eye contact, and they'd say, oh, man, this is not the average bear. And what they were really saying was this. What these three things chunk up to is that you are a person worth listening to. And even higher still, because you can help them achieve their goals. You can help them get what they want. People don't talk to you, give you the time of day, and they won't answer your questions. You need to ask them to get to the bottom of things if they don't think you're an expert, listen, show up as attack, you're on the board, enthusiasm. People say, oh, come on, Jordan, enthusiasm. I don't mean, oh my God, not that crap. I'm talking about something very different, bottled enthusiasm. It's an energy, it's a power inside you, it's a whisper, it's not yelling. It's something that just says, wow, this guy, man, he is serious. He means, girl, she is serious, she means business. And it's this force, this bottled enthusiasm. It's like you're a seething volcano, but you don't erupt because you're in complete control because you're an expert, you're a problem solver. And when they perceive you the right way, what do they do? They hand you control of the sale. Once that happens, it creates amazing possibilities. Because what I also figured out that night was what I was doing, there was these five core elements that I was lining up the same way every single time. Because my guys weren't in control, they couldn't run patterns, they couldn't, you get it? If you're reacting, it's like Mike Tyson, he gets into the ring, he's beating the hell out of you, like, ah, covering up, because he's in control, he corners you, and then bam, knocks you out, every fight's the same, he hits you, body blows, gets you in the corner, you're out. The novice is covering up on defense, same way as a novice salesman. The expert is in control. And when the expert's in control, it allows you to, number next thing you do, 
because you're in control, and here's the real keys to the kingdom, guys, is you don't use that to talk, 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 talk. That's not what I mean. When I talk about taking control, I don't mean you start talk. You start asking questions. You gather, so step one in the straight line syntax is you must take control. Because without control, there's no straight line. You're in the crooked line. You're here, you're there, you're everywhere. You can't do anything. Nothing good can happen. And by the way, I said to my guys, you got four seconds to establish these, these, these things. It turned out I was wrong. I was wrong. In 2015, Harvard University came out with a study. And they said it was five seconds. So I'm really sorry, I was off by a second. You know what they said? Here's weird, what they said is really weird. They said, if you, you have, they said you have five seconds to make the first impression or you're done. But here's what they also said, that if you make a negative first impression, it takes you seven subsequent meetings to change someone's mind about you. Can I ask you guys an honest question? Anyone here get seven shots to close seven meetings? <laughs> seven shots? Never happens. You got one shot, guys. Two at most. Usually one. You gotta, so how do we do this? So how do you take control like that? How do you establish it? Well, is it through the words you say? Hey, Jim, I'm sharp as attack. I'm too sick. I swear I should. Like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? The words don't exist. There are no magic words. The way we do it is twofold, through our tonality and our body language. And of course, saying the basic words. But as I always said, the, my pitch in the mortgage business that made me millions was like, hey, my name is Jordan, I'm a mortgage broker. What rate you pay? That was it. Now, of course, things came after that. I run the straight line. But the point was, is that there's no magic words. It's becoming an expert in tonality and body language. There are certain tonalities. There are actually 29. You're like, oh no, I gotta learn. No, guess what, guys? Of the 29 tonalities, let me take a sip real quick. <clears throat> of the 29 tonalities, there are 10 core influencing tonalities, right? And you don't even have to learn them. You already know them, every one of you. And you've used them a million times, just like I am now. And I lower my voice and I bring you in with a whisper. There's 10 tonalities. Use who's here has ever told a secret? Raise your hand and whisper it. Of course you have, right? Who's here had a time when you were so certain and you spoke certain? Raise your hand. Who's had a time when you really cared about something? You spoke with empathy. Who said that one? Every tonality you've used when you really felt it. What we learned to do with the straight line is to use them on purpose. At strategic points in a presentation, you will be shocked and how easy influence becomes. Cold calling, whether it's in person or the phone, and I gotta stop soon, guys, here, because I'm really over here, I'm sorry. But <clears throat> say, you know, hi, my name is Jordan. Hi, I'm Jordan, you know, from XYZ Company. They're like, click. I say, hey, my name's Jordan. I question from XYZ Company in Utah. They're like, huh, what? By phrasing a statement as a question, it paralyzes someone's internal monologue and stops them from narrating against you. In the first few seconds, there's so much, guys, that tonality, it's like it's a, a weapon for good, not a bad thing. It allows you to quiet their mind down to something, oh my God, this is a salesman, another salesman. So, because there's the, so late here, there's the conscious mind, let me end here. The conscious mind has a limited amount of processing power, right? So when you use tonality, every tonality has five words attached that the person hears without you saying them. I say to you, Jim, how you feel right now? He says, wow, he really means it. They hear that. They, their, their brain is trying to make sense of your tonality. So when you use tonality stacked together, their mind is completely saying, wow, what is he really, what's he saying? And they stop saying, what an ass, what an ass, what an ass. You get it? And it allows you to just get in. Because, the, you know what the front half of the sale is? It's about dying by death from a thousand cuts. There's no one thing you're gonna say in the front half of the sale that's gonna close it. It's a matter of not blowing it. 
Tonality, body language, how you make eye contact, how you shake hands, how close you stand to a door, what angle of your body is. It's, guys, once you learn these things, and then of course, I'll just end it like this, the five core elements, watch. They must love your product, right? Everyone knows that. But it's both on a logical and an emotional level. People don't buy on logic, they buy on emotion. I'm just gonna, let me give you a two minute, right? It's a matter of time. If people don't buy on logic, they buy on emotion. Logical certainty, right? Imagine a continuum, one to 10. One means they think your product is the biggest piece of crap in the world. They're absolutely uncertain. A 10 means it's the best thing since sliced bread. Your goal, as you move someone down the straight line, you want to get to a 10, as close to a 10 as possible, both logically and emotional. Logical certainty. Features, benefits, cost-benefit ratio, the value proposition, A, B, C. They can connect the dots, it makes sense, it fills their needs. Emotional certainty, future pacing. They imagine themselves six months down the road using your product and feeling back in control again. They feel good. People don't buy on logic. They buy an emotion, they justify with logic. But you have to create both to close at the highest level. Because if you fail to create logical certainty, you know what happens? The logical mind serves as what? The human bullshit detector. If you just say, it's so great, you'll feel great, they'll say, bullshit, bullshit. Alert, alert, alert. So, you, so what we do with a straight line, we create logical certainty first, which then frees someone up to be moved emotionally. That makes sense, yes? yes? I want someone to say to me, wow, Jordan, I love your product. I'm not buying it. That's logical certainty. The logical mind always wants to know more and think more. But when I say and imagine six months from now and you're using whatever it is, how great you'll feel, how good you'll feel about your family being protected, whatever it is you're selling, it's so powerful, guys. You say, why don't we do this? You give me one shot and believe me. The only problem you'll have is it didn't come here six months ago because you'll already be feeling great. Does that sound fair enough? And they say, sure, why not, okay? It's just like, it's so easy. Once you learn the straight line now, very quickly in closing, it's not enough if they just love your product. They also have to trust and connect with you, the influencer, and the company that stands behind the product. What you're doing as you move someone down the straight line from the open to the close, you're corralling a 10, 10, 10. That's your goal. 10, 10, 10. 10 on the product, 10 on you, 10 on the company in a single moment in time and asking for the order using the right tonality and right body language. And magic starts to happen. Now, sometimes you get people who are really tough. So there's two more elements. We call it the action threshold and the pain threshold. And I'm out of time here, guys, but there's two other elements for the tougher sales, right? And okay. at least it's not dog poop, all right? Anyway, in closing here, guys, let me tell you a story. It's important. I told you about vision, right? And as in every great vision, you have something called your why. And I know this is like self-development, you know, crap, but the way I do it, it's at a different level. I'm talking about really understanding why your vision matters to you. People say, I'm not motivated. You don't know your why. You don't have your why. When you really know why you want to succeed, why you want to get rich, that's power. You want, people say to me, journalists, I get interviewed, how were you, you went to jail, you're sitting in jail, the worst time in your life. How did you write The Wolf of Wall Street? How'd you do that? How'd you stay positive? I said, you know, it's a good question. I said, because you know what I would admit, when I was in my cell, I mean, listen, it wasn't the worst jail. I wasn't getting, you know, by Bubba. It wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> but jail's jail, right? It's terrible. But when I was in my bed at night, alone with my thoughts. And there was many nights I really felt like I couldn't go on. I really, I, and I would close my eyes and I'd imagine the faces of my children. That was my why. 
I let my daughter and I, I mean, I still get, I get the chills right now just from thinking of it, of that moment when I had to tell them the crying, the pain I'd caused them. I was determined to prove to my children that I could do it right, that their dad could come back again. When you can find your why, it's never about you. It's about someone you love unconditionally, your children, your husband, your wife, your parents, a cause you believe in. Seriously, that's your why. And you combine that, that, that inner game stuff with the straight line, you become unstoppable. And I love you all. Stand up one more time, come on. Close your hands together, come on. One, two, three. Yes! Imagine yourself one year down the road, you're using the straight line, you're making a ton of money, you feel good, the people you love and care about are, are enjoying the success you've created and you're just feeling so confident, you look great, you feel great, your life's exactly the way you want it. Just give me three yeses and one louder. One, two, three. Yes! Louder, one, two, three. Yes! Last one, one, two, three. Yes! All right, I love you all, you guys are the best.